I'm Arya Schwartz, and welcome to the Windsider Show, where it's all about the W. It's the WNBA offseason, but some of these WNBA stars are balling out overseas. Superstars are doing what they do, but so many youngsters or vets are using this time to fine-tune skills or maybe even add an element to their game. This episode, we have a guest joining to educate and prepare us for the Euro season. our show please consider joining our patreon community for less than a cup of coffee a month you can directly show support for the hard work we do covering the w and don't forget to see the amazing staff's written content over at winsider.com and for patreon it's patreon.com backslash winsider i'm really excited for this episode paul nilsson is a expert in euro league euro cup euro basket all the things that i aspire to be every WNBA offseason when i put on my hat and i say let's try and dig deeper into what's going on overseas. I'm very excited to learn from you, and I know the WNBA fans are excited. So before we get into it, welcome to the show, but where can fans read your content, see what you're talking about, and where you're dropping knowledge on uh, overseas basketball? Well, first, um, hugely thrilled to be part of the podcast. So, you know, thanks, thanks for the invite. Excited to talk about the European game, maybe some of the global game moving forward. Um, as well as the WNBA, and uh, I'm always kind of tweeting stuff um, at Basket Media 365. Um, I'm also FIBA's um, women specialist, so anything over at FIBA that's kind of women orientated, especially around Europe, there's a good chance that I've had a hand in that. Um, but it's you know it's just great to talk women's hoops and uh, be part of I think hopefully a growing. Um, community around women's basketball globally so really really excited to be here and uh, hopefully it'll be a good collaboration moving forward I agree I agree and and that's the thing women's basketball I feel like has an opportunity to really become much more of a global I don't even know the right term but much more of a global thing because in the, like for instance the WNBA has so many players that have dual nationality has so many players that play for their national teams overseas and are born and raised overseas, and then so many players that just play overseas. Like, the the lines have already connected, so it's just a matter of time, uh, I think, at least. And, and this is why, uh, for Windsider, we have always said, like, so many players, you know, in the same sense, the season doesn't end when, if the players view overseas as their main season or if they view the W as their main season, it doesn't end, what, like, it's a really interesting aspect. I'm excited to dive into it and excited to uh, kind of pick your brain of knowledge. But let's start this off. Can you explain to the fans who know nothing about overseas, what is Euro League, Euro Cup, and Euro Basket, and how are they different, the same, and, and just can you define them for the fans? Yeah, I mean, just, just before we get to those um, leading competitions, just to explain that, um, you know, within Europe, um, there's some pretty handy and pretty good quality domestic leagues going on. So obviously most weekends, um, the players in the WNBA who signed for various European clubs, they'll play, you know, um, France, Turkey, Russia, these types of leagues, which are, are pretty good. Some of the other ones, maybe not so much um, in terms of domestic strength. And then traditionally what's happened is that for the leading players, kind of the elite um, women ballers, they obviously look forward to midweek. Um, normally on a, a Wednesday or a Thursday, um, going back quite a few years, you've got two club competitions which are kind of um, tiered in two parts. So you've got the very top, which is EuroLeague women. Um, they have qualifiers. We've got some qualifiers coming up for teams to take the last two spots. But normally it's made up of 16 teams. Um from different countries, historical rankings come into it. So, um, you know, there might be three or four from Russia who've been historically great, um, only one team from other countries. But in essence, you have, I suppose, you, you guys and might call them conferences, two, two, two groups, eight teams, regular season. Um, normally what happens is the top four from each 
I'll go to the quarterfinals, played over kind of three um, a three game series, and then it comes right down to the finale, which is final four, um, traditional format, semi finals on the Friday, final on a Sunday, um, and then we have a, a champion, and that the Euroleague women, and especially final four, has such a rich tradition. Absolutely, the biggest names um, in in the women's game who've ever played have played in that tournament. And then below that, you have Euro Cup women. Is, real quick, is is that is for the fans? Is that final four and finals? Those are one game each, correct? Yeah. So yeah. So the final four is just uh, yeah two semifinals, and you get the uh, obviously the winners go through the final on uh, on, on the Sunday. Um, and and what happens is is <laughs> there's a little bit of added excitement. Um, I don't know if everyone would call it that, but you don't actually know where the final four is going to be until the four teams have qualified. So we only find out kind of four to six weeks before, um, sometimes even shorter where it's going to be because one of the clubs who are involved always hosts. So that's quite exciting, not knowing which wow. of the four clubs. You know, are we going to go yeah. to Istanbul? Are we going to go to far east of Russia, to Ekaterinburg? Are we going to be Central Europe? Prague, you know, we've, we've no idea. So that's quite exciting. Um, and then, like I say, you've got Euro Cup women, which is, um, I think we've even had almost 50 teams some season, which is um, broken down into really small groups, a um, couple of conferences based on uh, geography. Um, and you've got a, I would, I would say you've got a fair sprinkling of uh, WNBA players in, in Euro Cup women because some of the teams in EuroCup women are pretty strong and would do really well in EuroLeague women. It's just the fact that, obviously, EuroLeague women's only got 16 tickets. So, you know, some of those some of those clubs who are in really competitive countries might be better than some of those in EuroLeague women. So EuroCup women, really strong kind of tradition. Um, even in the past few years, people like Ali Quigley has won it at Galatasaray. Um, so you know it's 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 a really good two competitions to follow. Um, Eurobasket women, that's an international competition for national teams. It takes place every two years. There are qualifiers in in between. Um, the last final round when the medals were handed out um, was last summer, two thousand nineteen. Um, Spain and France basically compete nearly every final in the past few years. Um, so yeah, but I mean, Eurobasket women is just or the FIBA women's Eurobasket, as it's now called. In case anyone at FIBA is listening, um, really competitive. Um, obviously you have the women's basketball World Cup in the Olympics, but I think the thing about the FIBA women's Eurobasket is when you get those um teams there to final round, there's just there's no I don't want to say easy games, but at the global level there might be easier games. If you get maybe an African team or a South American team or, um, you know, teams of that ilk. But in Europe, basketball, women, there's just there's nowhere to go. Every game is is really, really tough. And uh, you've got the added dimension of quite a few WNBA players have played as naturalised players. I mean, I've just mentioned Quigley there. She played for Hungary. Van der Sloot's played for Hungary. Um, you know, there's... a uh, John Cole Jones is is playing for Bosnia and Herzegovina. So um, I know not everybody's happy with that kind of um, system, the naturalized system, but it's quite an interesting dynamic. No, it's definitely. And I I have to admit, I was for preparing for this. I was looking back and forth over some different rosters and I looked at UMMC and I looked at them and I was like, wait a second, I'm trying to figure out the number of Americans. And I was like, obviously, I know John Quell isn't American, fine. But then I was thinking, but she's not European. And then I realized that she plays for Bosnia, yeah. which that was a head scratcher for me. I, I was confused because I, I thought, fine, got to pay more attention that, to that. that. That's a whole different show. That's a whole different show. Naturalized, <laughs> naturalized players, you know, players who, to be fair, though, there are some naturalized players who have gained passports for, for example, for European countries and have played in that domestic league, have settled there. Um, and then there's other people who, you know, have, have barely spent any time in, in the country where they've got the passport. But yeah, that's a bit of a can of worms. We'll keep that for another another time. Oh, yeah. I mean, the one that comes to mind is when I think back to the the Shoptai story with Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi and how 
like he got Sue Bird Israeli citizenship when she hasn't really spent any time there just so she could play more minutes so they could have a better roster. But that that does lead me to my next question is kind of in these leagues, what are the rules regarding the number of Americans? Because I, I've heard in the past that in certain different domestic leagues, maybe this is a China thing, but um, they'll have limits on minutes you can play and limits on the number of Americans you can have on your team. So how does that play out? Yeah, I mean, in Europe, I mean, it's kind of consistent, you know. You can have a, I mean, some some leagues have a lower lower end, a couple couple of Americans, others might go up to to four, for example. Um, it's 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 relatively consistent, but yeah, I mean, I know, um, obviously in Asia that they're, they're, they're quite strict on it, and uh, got some great stories maybe for the future about players, you know, who've played in China, not realize quite realize those uh, the the rules. Um, that you know, I think in some cases they weren't even allowed to play in the final quarter of games at one point. Um, yeah, really strict. I think Korea dropped down, or they had only one um non-Korean player at one point, and obviously Japan don't have a huge number as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is what people have got to realize. I think that for the very top players, the the, the you know, I'm talking even within WNBA, you can almost probably put put the WNBA pool of players into say three or four pots. You know, so you've got Stewie at the top end, Tarazi in the past, earning riches, which, you know, even the WNBA could only dream of play, uh, paying to the top players. And then you've got the next tier down who kind of are on the radar of the biggest teams like the Katerinburg, getting great salaries. And then, you know, as you start going down, um, you, you know, you've got you've got players who are earning what, you know, nice money. Um, and then maybe some of those who are not getting a lot of time in the WNBA, especially in the current market, um, you know, it's a bit, a bit of a struggle. It's um, the, the women's market because of um, the coronavirus, just like all businesses and every part of life has been hit quite hard. So actually getting one of these pressure slots and that's how I'm trying to link it back. You know, if there's only if there's only a handful of spots available for import players, um, you know, those 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 are getting quite precious now because um like I say, some teams are are just not getting um import players. And and a lot of players, to be honest, probably don't want to leave the States. I mean I've heard of some players who don't want to travel you know, maybe at the lower end, they want to stay home this season. And I guess that's a, a decision that's kind of outside of basketball for family reasons, personal reasons. So coronavirus is just, just making a real mess of everything at the minute, as, as you can imagine. Well, I want to ask, you know, how this has affected the, the typical or standard layout, because everyone knows for the WNBA, if you're, if you're listening to this, you follow the WNBA, everyone knows they did a bubble. I've heard a few other countries have thought about doing bubbles. My understanding is Australia is doing a bubble, but I did think it's interesting for a shameless plug on our website, winsider.com. We do have a tab for our overseas tracker where you can go down and look at every team's roster from the 2020 WNBA season and where those players are playing overseas. And for me, it was really interesting because obviously I think travel restrictions probably played a part into this where Americans are allowed to travel to currently with COVID. But there, I mean, overwhelmingly, the players in the W are playing in Turkey in a variety of teams. Um, Is Turkey always been such a hotbed for women's basketball? Yeah, I mean, in the in the what I would call in the kind of past uh, when I say modern era, I say like the past ten years, but especially the past five years. um, Russia and Turkey is uh, kind of the leagues where the money's been. Uh, maybe not completely from top to bottom, but definitely in terms of those those top level players earning a very high salary. But to be to be honest, there's been a lot of controversy because ever since that's happened, the last five or ten years, Russia and Turkey, um, the the domestic players have been sat on the bench. So when the national teams come to play, both have struggled in the last few years. It's kind of uh, the chickens are coming home to roost now because I've had so many foreigners um, taking up the minutes. So it's always quite a delicate balance, I think, when, you, when you're when you a European league as to how many overseas players you get, how it benefits the promotion of the league, the profile of the league, but kind of what damage it could be doing to the homegrown players who obviously, you know, a lot of, a lot of federations and different countries obviously want the national team to do well because that's what sells it to young kids you know they want to see if you're in turkey you want to see an ishil alban or whoever it is you know somebody turkish starring 
um, in the domestic league as much as they might love, you know, whoever it is from the WNBA as well. So, you know, it's quite a, I think it's a, a real challenge and it always has been. It's uh, it's not really went away. It's just something that'll continue. And it touches on what we said before um, in Asia as well, who have quite a strict kind of approach to, to how many um, how many overseas players play. Yeah, and talk to me about COVID. I mean, has that affected, have they reduced the number of games? Has there been like a implemented, I would assume, plan of safety procedure? I mean, like how has COVID affected besides, you know, salaries and sponsorship? Yeah. How has COVID affected kind of the makeup of the league? Yeah, it's, it's completely um, destroyed is a, is a strong word, but it's completely kind of forced those who are in um who are tasked with running leagues to completely, you know, kind of rip up the, the 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 regular season kind of format. So, for example, I said before about Euroleague women, the premier competition, having, um, you know, these games on a Wednesday and Thursday, one game a week, midweek, across, I don't know, starts in October, finishes in early March, ahead of the, the postseason, um, break for Christmas, really easy. Um, well, that's that's completely been uh, ripped up now. We've now got four groups of four, and they're going to be played in single venue hubs. It uh, it's set times through the season, so we've got one in November, one in um, January. Um, so you know, even just the dynamic. If you think that if you're an athlete, I spoke to Chelsea Gray um, just last week, and uh, she was making the point that. You know, you, you haven't got the travel grind every week of playing domestically, say she's in Spain with Girona, and then ordinarily in every season before, you know, on a Monday they'd have a rest day, then on Tuesday they could be travelling to Russia, play a game on the Wednesday, travel back on the Thursday, rest or practice on the Friday, and then another Spanish league game, and just press the repeat button. Well, you know, the dynamic of now having to play mini tournaments um, you know, it's three set times through the season or whatever it is. It's a totally different dynamic. So, yes, you score in terms of not having to have the, the grind each week. But, you know, if you've got a little injury or something, you could miss, you know, a, a, a chunk of court time all at once. So it's just, just really, really different um, kind of feel to it. And uh, I know that I'm going to certainly miss uh, the Wednesdays and Thursdays because for 10 years I've been in the very fortunate position of covering Euroleague women and it's just going to be a crazy kind of season, just peaks and troughs really. So, um, you know, it's it's going to be different, but then we've had to make so many different adjustments in, in our personal lives worldwide. It's, um, I guess it's just another to add to the list. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, we just finished the WNBA season and I got to say, as much as I'm sad it's over, I'm glad to get a little bit of uh of those 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 valleys as we were talking about because the whole WNBA season was just 100 miles per hour you know every five minutes there was a game it felt like anything you tried to do uh coverage wise at least for us was like outdated within 12 hours so good luck best of luck to you um let's talk about some of these players let's talk about stars who are the big names in Eurobasket uh, well, in in Eurobasket, if we're talking in, and I, I mean, are, are we going to talk Euroleague first, just quickly? Yeah, let's do yeah, Euroleague. Let's ju- just quickly yeah. because the season's about a t- um about a tip off. Well, obviously we've mentioned the Katerinburg, and I would uh, I would urge anybody to do exactly what you said before in terms of just have a look down the roster. Um, so at the moment, I mean, they've got Alba Torrens of Spain, they've got Ali Quigley. Courtney van der Sloot, they've got Stewie, they've got Messerman, they've got Jones, they've got Greiner, they've got Vedeva. You know, it just absolutely crazy kind of roster. Um, and I think the question, um, and we were chatting just, just briefly, weren't we, before we started, and it's a question mm-hmm. everybody asks, everybody asks me, can anybody beat um, Ekaterinburg this year? You know, I've heard that for 10 seasons. Um, <laughs> same question. But what I would say is, Ekaterinburg haven't kind of won four, five, six in a row. Um, so, you know, there's history in even the past 10 years, very recent history has seen that it can be done. Um, we've had a lot of one-time winners. We had Prague, we had Galatasaray. You know, we've we've had clubs who've uh, made history with first first wins, um, and it hasn't all been about Ekaterinburg. So, yeah, some great players. 
Uh, well, I'm I'm curious. I'll... Well, first of all, I was a little disappointed to see Stewie sign with them. I was hoping that she would say on Dynamo, um, because I I feel like she could have built that team up to beat them. I thought that would have been you know I love the clashing of those two teams. Dynamo was the first uh, overseas team that I ever paid attention to because they had Simone Augustus when I was a young Minnesota Lynx fan, um, and when she was on them, I was paying attention to them trying to figure out what she was doing overseas. But I'm curious, who was on these teams that was able to dethrone uh, Ekaterinburg? Ooh, so where where should we start? Um, I'm, I'm testing. I'm testing your memory. <laughs> well, actually, I, I have to say, but probably when I say my favorite, I mean it's. I, I remember. I think uh, am I getting the air uh, mixed up? It's around 2015. I think it was maybe in 2000. No, 2015. Um, Prague had. Um, who did they have? They had Kia Vaughan was um, MVP. Uh, they had uh, Sonia Petrovic, now Sonia Vasic. Um, who else did they have? Uh, Daniel Robinson. Uh, just had um, a really, really kind of dynamic and smart team. And what happened was, is Tarazi missed. Um, and even though Candice Park, I was, you know, great in the final uh, for, for Ekaterinburg. Uh, Prague were on the home floor. They had great support. Um, I was just waiting for kind of a Katerinburg to win, but um, I just remember Vaughan was just hitting everything, dominant defensively, standing up uh, to, to a Katerinburg, and it was just one of the great nights. Um, and then I remember, in I think it was the year, was it the year earlier, when Galatasaray won? Galatasaray, actually, I mean, this really, really was, I, I didn't know where to look. Galatasaray went to a Katerinburg, who were hosting Final Four. It was supposed to be, you know, one big party, a Katerinburg at home, 5,000 people, um, you know, get Galatasaray in the semi-finals, supposed to be easy, and what happens, they get beat. So you can imagine on the on two days later, 48 hours later, a Katerinburg aren't even in the final, and the expectation was that they were going to win, and here's Galatasaray playing um, arch-rivals Fenerbahce for the final, and it, it just felt so wrong to be inside their home when uh, <laughs> this party, you know, it's like going to a party and the hosts kind of not being there or standing yeah. in the corner and you're, you're kind of dancing wildly and enjoying yourself and it's just not how it meant to be. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the script does get torn up from time to time and uh, that's that's really, really important. Um, even during the regular season um, last year, uh, Riga, who I'm not even sure if they'd won a game. They they beat a Katerinburg. And, they had not won a game. I yeah, remember not, that. yeah, and, and, and it was described by the Latvian kind of sporting press as the biggest result in Latvian sporting history against a Russian team. You know, in any sport, um, certainly in basketball, but you know, um, just because of the history between the two countries and everything else and the rivalry. But, you know, I, I remember what, watching that, and I don't know if it's the same, you know, for you sometimes when you've, you're you watching great WNBA teams. You just wait for them to win. You wait, you wait, you wait, and it just doesn't happen. And you get to the last few minutes, and then you think, oh, wow. You know, just any given night. And I guess that's that's what we're talking about in any season. It doesn't matter how big favourites, especially in one-off games, um, I guess different in di- different in the WNBA in, in the NBA when you have you know final series, um, but certainly in Euroleague women with a one-off final one game, uh, the value is that you just never know. Yeah, I was. I mean, I completely just hearing you say that made me think of okay. Well, first of all, it it gives so much more opportunity to the underdog because it is a one-off game, and I completely know what you're talking about. You'll be watching these games thinking to yourself. Okay, yeah, good good show. I mean, for WNBA fans, there was a game between uh, the Seattle Storm, who were just dominant running through every team this season, and they faced the Indiana Fever, a team that really was the bottom of the pack. And throughout the whole game, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, Fever did a good job, but it's just a matter of time before the Storm kind of hit that next gear and run over them. And then there's a minute, two minutes left in the game, and you're going, huh, Yeah, th- th- they might not win this game. Yeah. Like, that might not happen. Well, b- back to Euroleague. Talk to me more about Euroleague. Yeah, so Euroleague, I think um, you mentioned Dynamo Kursk um, before that. I think I don't think they've maybe got as much um, of a, of a um, budget as, as they have in the last few years, but they've still pricked up some um, pretty useful players. They have uh, Amanda Zawi, um, they have um, Alex Bentley, they have Enrique Ogunbowale, 
the half, Stephanie Mavunga. You know, they're, they're going to have some decent decent players, so they'll be competitive. Prague, um, once again, they're going to have um, a really good a really good team. They're going to have Brianna Jones back. Elisa Thomas has been, well, an absolute colossus um, for me, anyway. When you, whenever you watch EuroLeague women, I mean, talking, she, I always look, she's the one player in EuroLeague women, when I check a box score, if I'm not watching the games, because there's a lot of games going on at once, um, very often, I'm looking for the triple double every time. I'm <laughs> looking for the triple double. I'm like, right, okay, uh, what's the Prague score? Okay, it's in the third quarter. Um, where's she at? And she'll have, I don't know, 14, 14 points, eight rebounds, seven assists. And I'm thinking, okay, is it going to be triple double night? And, uh, you know, Joan's done such a great job. Uh, Fenerbahce, always interesting. Um, they've got uh, Zander Lassini. Um, they've got a great coach in Victor Lapena. Very famous club. They've never won EuroLeague women. It's been, it's, this is kind of the whole They've thing. never won. They've never won. And can you imagine? I mean, to, I, I don't know in the States how much um, people understand the rivalry between Fenerbahce and Galatasaray. It's one of the world's great sporting rivalries. I mean, you, you know, you could play a game of cards. You could play yeah. any game. Um, and you'll get a crowd if it's Fenerbahce against um, <laughs> Atasaray. Honestly, um, anything marbles. They just they're just crazy to you know crazy good sets of passionate fans. And when I when I was explaining about that game, then Galatasaray won um, at Ekaterinburg in 2014. I think it was you know it was Fenerbahce against Galatasaray in the final, and that was the. History had to be made because both of them have chased Euroleague women title for so long. No Turkish club had ever won it. So not only wow. were they going, not only were they going to get the their first Euroleague women title, but they were going to be, get that thing that will never be taken away. One, they, be, they were the first Turkish club, and secondly, they did it before their rivals. So Fenerbahce have really had to swallow a bitter pill. They've been so close. I think they've been a number of finals, just came up short. Um, but they've got Satu Sabali this year. They've got Kayla McBride, Kia Vaughan, who I was talking about before. I love McBride. She does a great job in Europe. Um, so, you know, they're going to be interesting this season. Um, Galatasaray have, have, have got a good a good roster as well. So they'll be looking to make moves. So, it, you know, it it really is just can anybody beat a Catherine Burke? But we've been saying that for the last 10 years. And the answer is probably not, but you never know. <laughs> well, I'm curious for, for me, at least I look at overseas and I always wonder, and we're going to get into this because I hope we're going to have you on a few more times during this season. But I always wonder how, you know, the play of young players in Eurobasket or in EuroLeague is going to kind of reflect into the W. I'm curious for someone who covers on your end, do you look at WNBA seasons and go, oh, Kayla McBride really struggled this WNBA season. That is going to affect my prediction of what we're going to see from Fenner. You know, I mean, I could be completely wrong on this, but I kind of look at um, kind of look at WNBA and uh, the European game as apples and pears a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just think I, I always have. I've just always viewed it with, with different hats. Um, and it, it's kind of linked because I guess as well as WNBA players, you know, you've mentioned McBride going from, say, a season where they've struggled to Europe, where maybe they've shined in the past to regain a bit of confidence. Um, I always judge a player by what they've done in Europe. And I get mm -hmm. for a lot of WNBA fans, it wouldn't matter if between now and next uh, next March, somebody's been incredible in Europe. The, the first reference point is often the last time that they did anything in the WNBA. So I, I think there is that kind of separation in terms of the, the kind of the leagues, the outlook. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Um, and maybe the part we said at the beginning about um, strengthening the ties um, of the women's basketball community globally is to think about these players more in the round. Um, you know, we've got great areas and avenues that we can explore in the future. The fact that women have to play more or less three, six, five, no rest, you know, with all the international tournaments as well, three X three, 
as well an added kind of menu of things that players are having to do so yeah just a really interesting dynamic but I, for, for, for me I am guilty I will put my hands up and say that whatever's happened in, in the WNBA season I, I'll always think well you know how did McBride do in our last European assignments because it, it, it is slightly different it's a slightly different dynamic. Winsider.com is a one-stop shop for all your WNBA news, debates, and conversations. But we can't do it without your help. Become a subscriber at patreon.com backslash Winsider. For just a few dollars a month, you can help grow the game. Well, let's talk about some of these stars from EuroBasket or EuroLeague. I mean, I'm just curious when it comes, is it as simple? Because look, obviously there's going to be players who are born and bred in Europe and don't play in the W who are going to be a certain level of stars in these leagues are there any players i know i know like the wnba isn't your cup of tea specifically but i'm curious you obviously know enough to know whether or not someone's a superstar in the w are there any players that you know wnba fans might be shocked to find out is a bigger name overseas like kayla mcbride is a good example i think yeah there is i think there's a lot of examples of um of, of players who maybe made their name uh, well, obviously playing in the WNBA, I mean, I might, I might get this wrong, but I would think maybe Sleuth Quigley, um, you know, when they were first playing the WNBA, they were probably already, as far as I'm aware, putting up good numbers in Europe um, and, and getting a great reputation. Um, so it's really interesting. But for me, the, the most interesting element of what, of what you've just asked is those um, European players who are going the other way. Specifically, European players, because oh, I've had some, oh, I've had some, um, some good debate, shall we say, um, about people like Maria Videva before the draft. Um, you know, I was getting a little bit hammered about um, on social media about how much I rated her, but you know, I've watched her since she was a fifteen-year-old kid. Um, I've seen her play at EuroBasket uh, Women when she was sixteen in taking apart experienced EuroLeague women level centers for the national team at 16 um Jeez. you know at a really high level um and then you know i've i've had players who got drafted um who've who've been on my list and i've just wanted to do well and this year we finally saw julie alamon show what's possible when a coach and a team a franchise trusts um, a non-American player, and I'm not anti-American by any stretch of the imagination. I just think, mm-hmm. I just think having that great cosmopolitan kind of uh, mix of different players that represents the global game, and I, I was so thrilled when uh, Julie played so well for the for the Fever. Okay, and it wasn't didn't go on to win a, a, a title or anything like that. But I I think it's like that's kind of what you you're asking as well. In some ways, is like. Mm-hmm. Who do I see in Europe? And then I think, you know, I, I was really backing Julie to shine, but the question was, somebody taught, somebody said to me, well, obviously point guard, most trusted, difficult position on a basketball floor, maybe she'll not get quite the opportunity, nothing against her, but it is more difficult, I guess, for coaches to kind of tr- trust players first season in that position. Um, and I, I was just really, really thrilled because, for me, as somebody who's not American, not a number one WNBA fan, my biggest complaint has always been the WNBA has felt a little too vanilla for me. Um, and by that, I just meant great athleticism, great physicality, great shooting, some of the legends of the game, you know, a great league. It's, it, you know, you would say, well, that's the best league, but I just think having a more like I said, a cosmopolitan feel to it with different players from different countries. You know, I'd love to see more Asian players in the WNBA as well. So it's a truly global league. And I just think if the WNBA wants to really solidify its appeal, it would, you know, if it could get um, more Asian players moving forward, for example, more European players, um, then I think everybody wins. Um, especially the WNBA. So no, I completely agree with you. You're I like, and I, I just think it's a situation where it can help grow the league. But I, I also hear the argument when it came to, to Alman about like, you know, this is a situation where I, I always like to think of the point guard as kind of the floor general and extension of the coach. Yeah. I know it's cliche to say this. Um, so I, I get it. I mean, 
we've seen this throughout the W for WNBA fans. I mean, with uh, Crystal Dangerfield this season, a lot of people were talking about the rookie coming in. Is she going to get her shot? She forced her way. And I think, you know, for a different set of circumstances, but Alman kind of did the same thing where they had a hole to be filled because a player wasn't there due to COVID. And she took advantage of the minutes and played so well. It was undeniable that she should be getting these minutes. But you talked about someone that I want to touch on, Maria Vidiva. She's one of three players that I think when you're talking about overseas basketball and the WNBA, thinking about those players who are coming over from overseas to the W, the players that come to mind, I'm sure you have a few more, are Temi Fegbentley, uh, Chechi Zandalosini, and Maria Vidiva. And I'm curious, what... What can you tell us more about them? Because we hear constantly about specifically those three players. And like I said, I'm sure you can name a few more and and feel free to. But we keep hearing about how great these players are. Is it just a matter of they haven't really been given the reins? They haven't been given the minutes to truly explode? I mean, Vidiva had a great shot. uh, What was it? In 2019, she played well for the Sparks. Um, She had a good stint when there were some injuries on the team. and She took advantage of minutes. But is it? Is it as simple as, you know, they just haven't gotten the minutes and that's why we haven't seen the explosion that we kind of heard tied to these players' names or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, you know, every, every case, you know, point, I'm pointing out the obvious here, but, you know, every case is individual because they are individual players. And I think that when you look at the three that you've kind of mentioned, um, let, let's start with Xander Lassini. What a talent in terms of scoring ability. Watched us since she was like, 14, 15 years old, uh, come through the youth the youth teams for Italy, absolutely destroy everybody in front of her with her scoring ability, um, burst onto the scene uh, for the senior um, Italian national team uh, in 2017. And then suddenly, a few weeks later, Minnesota get a hold of her, right player at the right time, on the rise, great hungry talent, um, she went. She then on the European side. She's went to Fenerbahce for the last couple of seasons. Done pretty well. Um, and you know, I think that for her, you, you have to remember a bit like Videva. You know, she's she's not like twenty eight, twenty nine. You know, she's got time on her side. Um, and I, I just think that you know the likes of Xander Lassini could do what Alamon's done this 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 year. But you know that that taking all she has to take shots, and I think that's the problem. Is is any is any coach really going to let her take the volume of shots that she gets in Europe? Because that's what she's about: high volume, high high scoring. Um, Vadeva, well, you know, my opinion of Vadeva is, for me, I still think in five years' time, everybody, and I mean everybody globally, will look at Maria Vadeva with a totally different eyes. Um, to what they might look now, because I think what you're saying is people probably WNBA slash stateside know she's a decent player, she's a good player, um, she's still very young, unless I'm mistaken, she's 22, something like that, she's two years younger than than, than Wilson, two years, oh, wow. well, you know, you have to compare Videva, and that, you have to compare Videva and Wilson with what Wilson was two years ago, and Wilson, to her credit, has been incredible these last couple of years. But Videva hasn't had that two-year jump forward that Wilson's just mm-hmm. experienced. And I think, you know, when you're Videva, you, you, you're playing on a relatively stacked team, WNBA. You're playing on the most stacked team in terms of a Katerinburg. Um, she comes in. She's like a... I mean, she is just a basketball machine to me. She comes in, gets her rebounds, makes her shots, incredible efficiency, um, and steps out. For Russia, she does everything. Um, so I just, you know, I just think if you if you get to watch some Euroleague women on, on YouTube or you get to watch some Eurobasket women when it comes around next year, um, you, you know, you really, really just just have a look at Videva in a, in a Katerinburg vest and have a look at her um, in, in a Russia vest and you, you'll see exactly what she can do against some top-level players. Temi, she's a fellow British um, citizen. Well, that's, like, why I had, that's why I had to throw her to I'm, you, man. Tammy Fat Benley has been in the front of my car while driving along when I was I was kind of connected with Great Britain. We were doing a, a media thing. Um, Tammy, hugely intelligent, uh, smart player, um, great temperament. Um, you know, she'll get you the rebound. She she pull post moves, etc. But 
Um, she, she was actually fantastic last summer. She got in the All-Star 5 at Eurobasket Women for a job with helping Great Britain get to the semi-finals, which was a historic step. Um, for me, Tammy's just a really, really good player. Um, what I think what you've got to do when you're considering players like this is, is, is put the list alongside as to who's playing in that place, if that makes sense. You know, I think yeah. we all have different opinions on who, who's the better player. So they're, they're all different. I mean, you know, I suppose character-wise and everything, Xander Lassini's maybe a bit more, um, what's the word, a bit more complex in by her own admission. Um, you know, she she's um, a very complicated character, I think, in a good way. Um, so, you know, Vadeva's probably more mechanical and on the court, she's still young, she's still learning. And Temi would do a job for me for any WNBA team. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously other players coming up, but, um, you know, it'll be exciting to see whether the likes of, um, excuse me, whether the likes of uh, Julie Alamon can obviously return and repeat because that's what it's all about. You can't just have one good season in the WNBA. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can do it year after year if you want to be a, a regular. No, totally. And and in a moment, I want you to kind of, before we, we sign off for the day, is tell us where we can find uh, these final ticket punching games uh, for the fans in the USA. Is it on YouTube? Where is it? Where can we watch the rest of your early games? But I'm curious, the question that's been on my mind, you watch UMMC, and I, I apologize to the fans who we have just talked about UMMC so much, but I need to know, what is kind of the direction or the face of this team? Because... You look at this roster of so many superstars. It is a WNBA all-star roster lineup. Who's taking the last shot? Like, who's kind of the leader of this team, I guess, is the question that I'm so curious of when you have all these superstars. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> well, I was about to say, now, now Tarazi's left, um, it's a lot easier. Because <laughs> that, <laughs> that wasn't even a question for the great Spartak teams that she was, uh, you know, four-time champion in a row and then went to Carter and Bird and she, she, she was taken, it wasn't she? But nothing changes. It just, you know, she can she can travel across the Atlantic to Europe, but that, that, that was always the same. But it's that's a really, really good and interesting question because um, I think in years gone by, you kind of knew kind of where the ball was going but now I mean you know you've got Griner inside you've got Stewie you've got Messerman um you've got Vidiva um you know Sloot's gonna create um maybe they're missing the shooting guard <laughs> so uh yeah it, it, it's an interesting question I, and I couldn't tell you and that I think that'll be music to the ears of uh of, of, of everybody involved with the Katarinburg because if I can't tell you then I'm sure, you know, coaches are going to struggle. Fans aren't going to know. And that's the beauty of having such a talented team. Um, you, you wouldn't know who to double team. You wouldn't know who to start. Um, oh, God. It, it, it sounds team. like a nightmare to coach against that team. It, it, well, it is, yeah, because they've, they've got a really a really good coach in uh, Miguel Mendes as well, who came in a couple of years ago. And actually, he inherited when Maya Moore was playing. Um, mm -hmm. Before she kind of took a step out of the sport for a while and um, went on to win it. Um, really, really good guy, really good coach, very level-headed. Um, and I, I, I always laugh when I see him because I, I watch him coaching and I just think he must have the mind of a, a kind of beautiful mind of a mathematician to keep <laughs> all of those players happy. And every time I come off, I'm like, Vadeva, yeah, okay, she got her 15 minutes. Um, you know, you, you just have to squeeze all these players in and uh, that's the way it is. But it's a nice, a nice selection headache to have, no? Yeah, oh, I would not. Mind, I would not mind being the coach of, of Ekaterinburg. Uh, going against them, I think I would like block off the month before. Uh, no games, just film room and practice, and try and figure out which player. Because it, it, I don't. Yeah, it's horrible. It's no matter who you choose, you're gonna get some poison. Um, real quickly before we log off for today, where can fans? Uh, who are not overseas, or even fans who are overseas, we do have some overseas listeners, where can they watch these games? Okay, so if you um, check out hashtag EuroLeague Women across all social media channels, I have to say the guys at FIBA have done a really, really excellent job in the last kind of 80 months to two years to really transform those platforms. You know, they're doing a decent job before. 
but they've got some incredible content now. Um, so, you know, you really have to lock into those things. Um, also, YouTube, the games are normally free f- free to view on YouTube. Um, just punch in there, EuroLeague Women Go at the FIBA channel. They're on there. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting because um, kind of the final four, um, often is you have to pay, and uh, I think it's been smart that they've kind of had the whole regular season in the past few seasons free for people to get engaged and get interested in. So definitely opportunities to watch game for free, games for free, and even Euro Cup women. You know, if you if you check out that great tracker, that overseas tracker that you've got on the website, anybody listening to this, I've had a look. Really great job. If there's a player there that you think um, is, is playing Euro Cup women, there's a Euro Cup women website. A lot of the games there are free. The clubs, the clubs will show them on YouTube. Um, so you know, there's there's opportunities there if you hashtag Euro League Women or Euro Cup Women, you can watch as much as you want. Um, especially if you're an insomniac and you're up during the night in the states, I guess. <laughs> Well, and then you can also the beauty of it, honestly, is that when it's on YouTube, you can rewatch it whenever. So, like, yeah, true. And and you know, you don't have to do the the classic uh, tell all your friends, don't tell me what the score is, so so I don't ruin it for myself. Um, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Remind the folks where they can find your uh, your writings and your thoughts. Yeah, at Basket Media three six five on social channels, and if you check out FIBA Basketball, um, much of the women's content, especially on the Euroleague women, the Euro Cup women, and the EuroBasket women websites, are, are mine. And I also do a, a kind of fortnightly column called Paul Nelson's Women's Basketball Worldwide. Love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, I hope to be able to catch up again soon and talk some more women's hoop women's hoops rather.